1997, the members of Foo Fighters convened after a holiday break and decided to re-record their album, The Colour and The Shape. The endeavour brought critical and commercial success for both the individual record and the band as a whole. Moreover, the epic album provided the opportunity to incorporate a new song, a hit that would become one of their most lasting and powerful tracks ever long. Hello there, it's Warren Hewitt here. I hope you're doing marvellously well. Welcome back to another episode in the series. If you haven't already, please subscribe. If you hit the notification bell, you'll be notified when we have a new video. And if you're into music production, you can get a whole bunch of free goodies when you sign up for the email list over at Produce Like a Pro. In 1996, Dave Grohl was at Bear Creek Recording Studio working on the song Monkey Wrench. In between takes, he stumbled upon a single chord that inspired a riff that would eventually become the song Everlong. He quickly recorded it to preserve the idea and thought that it sounded similar to a Sonic Youth song. The band later tried jamming and expanding on the new riff, but ultimately they concluded the Beer Creek sessions without fully composing something tangible. Grohl was now on break in Virginia during the holidays, and it was an emotional time in his life. Recovering from the pain of a divorce, he was crashing at a friend's house in a sleeping bag on the floor. Around Christmas time, he revised the chords he had developed at Bear Creek into a fully fledged song. He went into an old friend's recording studio and laid down a demo, playing all the parts himself. Before taking the song back to the band, he made one last check. I remember actually I played it for Thurston and Kim from Sonic Youth, because I was deathly afraid I had just ripped off a Sonic Youth song somehow. After receiving both permission and enthusiastic support, Grohl could now bring the song to the rest of the band. Everlong and the rest of the album were produced by Gil Norton, with Bradley Cook as the engineer. Chris Sheldon mixed the record and Bob Ludwig did the mastering. The song was recorded at Grandmaster Studios in Los Angeles. Cook explained that they all returned after Christmas and decided to re-record the entire album from their Bear Creek sessions. We did the record and came back for Christmas vacation and everyone listened and decided that we didn't really, we didn't really get it. I guess the drums weren't super happening on, on most of the songs, some but not all. And so by retracking the drums, which of course was Dave retracking the drums, mm, yeah. it felt like you wanted to rebuild the guitars on the top now because there was a higher level of energy from the drums? Oh yeah, there's no redo in the drums. We had to redo everything for sure, ground up. So right. that's what we did. So, you know, I suggested going to Grandmaster because it's kind of like my home studio. We went there and just knocked it out because we already, we already did it. So we knew, knew it was up with all the songs and we just, it was fast. We, we were finishing a song, then we'll go down the street to Skip Sailors uh, to Chris Sheldon to mix. Everlong begins with that unforgettable guitar line. Beyond the fortuitous yet pleasing way that each chord sits in the riff, the rhythm itself is incredible. Recently, Grohl explained that he thinks of the guitar in his mind the way he thinks about drums. So when he plays Everlong, he hears it as a kick drum pattern. So I look at the lower strings like kicks and snares, and I look at the higher strings almost as if they're cymbals. So the pattern in which I'm strumming, the it's almost like a kick drum pattern, like do do da do da da do da do da do da 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 like that. Both Grohl and Pat Smear played guitar on the track, with Bradley Cook overseeing the recording. It was probably the R.D. standard, yeah. Oh, the R.D. standard? Mm-hmm. And it's a, a, there's a Fender Tone Master, one of those blonde Tone Masters. Right. And a boogie cab. How did you mic the cab? I, I bet it was 87 and 57. That's, that's like Gil's favorite. 87, 57. You know, a nice middly one, a nice bitey, bitey sound in that, yeah. you know, together. It's in super phase, of course. So, butted up together? Yeah. I think so. So 87 cap, cap, you know, Capsule to capsule, you know, that kind of thing. Just right. All lined up. Right, all lined up. And what's Pat doing? He's doing some of the big chunk guitars on this? They're both definitely playing on it, you know? Yeah. It's very, like, lefty-righty, Dave, Pat, yeah. you know, and then the, the other bits by Dave in the middle. Nice. All that stuff. Pat's guitar is a Hagstrom. He was using Kurt Cobain's live setup, oh, which wow. was some kind of preamp and then, like, a Crown 1,000-watt power amp and then <laughs> to the Marshall, and we kept blowing up speakers in the Marshall. No kidding. It sounded really, really good. Yeah. So, so yeah. It's like just get, we just kept putting new speakers in and yeah. kept blowing them. But that's, that's how we got Pat's on. It's, you know, it's a real like middly, 
a punky, middly kind of sound, right. complimentary to the boogie, basically. Right. You know. The drums were recorded by Grohl for the record, just as he had done on the demo. There's the drum room. I love how you can tell there's a human being playing, that you can hear the flamming between the kick and the snare on the floor on the floor groove. It's great. So Ross Garfield was our the drum doctor. Drum doctor we got yeah. to hire a drum doctor for some drums and stuff. And that snare is the legendary Terminator snare, the Tama Bell Brass. Right. That was used on all kinds of stuff. What was the rest of the kit? Was it a Gretsch kit? It was a Gretsch kit, 20, yes. 22 inch kick, and you know, just a blonde standard awesome Gretsch kick. So let's have it a quick sure listen is. to that snare. So what, what are you using mic-wise? Probably a 57 at that point. Top and bottom? There was probably a 57 for the under snare as well. 57? Yeah, okay. Because at that time I would have done something like that, whereas now I never do that. Right. Real boring 4421s four, four, four on the toms, which I would never do that now. Yep. <laughs> so like, 421s on the toms, yeah. Kick was probably a f the Fat 47 and a, probably a 421 inside. The bass was played by Nate Mendel. Probably a P bass and SVT, right? I mean, that's 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 probably what definitely was. feels SVT ish. Yeah, for sure. But I think it was a P bass, not a jazz bass. How would you mic the SVT? I think it was probably the Fat Forty Seven on that. Right. You know? and, and Nate plays very very lightly. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? When, when with the bass player who plays not too hard, it doesn't fret out, so you get more low end from the bass. Oh yeah. Everlong was written in the aftermath of a breakup but it is, at its core, a love song. Grohl explained in 2006 that Everlong is about a girl that I'd fallen in love with, and it was basically about being connected to someone so much that not only do you love them physically and spiritually, but when you sing along with them, you harmonize perfectly. Grohl's vocals were likely recorded on a U67 and are, as always, incredible at matching the feel of the song. This comes from both his performance as well as the creativity used in recording them. For instance, for background vocals, he brought in Louise Post of Veruca Salt, and she sang background vocals through a telephone. Now, there is a girl vocal here singing the riff. She was in Chicago, and we're in Hollywood at Grandmaster. So uh, you did it on a phone? Yeah, we did phone. So so we had the, um, <laughs> you know, her monitor was the the telephone next to the NS10 in the control room. Yeah. We recorded her on the other phone with a probably an eighty seven or something. I would imagine just sitting there on the on, this, on the bench on just like a little stool. So she's hearing through a phone da, 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 on the guitar riff, and she's singing along with it, and you're recording it back on. That's right. She's okay. aping the guitar riff, yeah. And then later on, and that's so that's through a telephone, so that's why it sounds like that. And it's just you know, there's I mean, I don't know what happened in the mix for compression, but it was pretty pretty flat line from the yeah. telephone, I guess. And then Dave went back later and used good old. Good old static for his, you know, because it's like a telephone yeah. for his uh, harmonies on that part. Oh, wow. And there's, you know, it's all tape, so she had to get it right. <laughs> there's, there's no moving anything around, you know. Wow, it's crazy to hear this. That is insane. That's all the head, that's all the speaker bleed for her, isn't it? God, that's crazy. Finally, the track brings in some really interesting effects, including a distorted whispering sound in the background. Cook explained that the recording captures Grohl 
retelling a childhood story of assistant engineer Ryan Bosch. Now, in the breakdown, we've got this. Oh, God, you can hear the story. So what is he saying? So assistant Ryan Bosch told us a story. His dad would, you know, when his dad would come home from his night job and he had to sleep in the daytime, when, when him and his brother were too loud, his dad would give him, like, military punishment and have them hold the boots at the foot of his bed, hold them up while he slept. Hold them up while he slept. Hold the boots up. If you're making noise, he made him hold his boots up. Wow. And so that's Dave's just retell retelling the story. We did three tracks. It was Ryan's, Ryan's story. Yeah. And a couple of tracks of him reading from some random book. Released on August the 18th, 1997, Everlong was the second single following the band's The Color and the Shape album, which had been released a few months earlier in May. The single hit number 18 on the UK singles charts and made it to the top five for Billboard's alternative airplay and mainstream rock charts in the US. It has remained a staple of the Foo Fighters' live repertoire ever since its release. Even though Taylor Hawkins never played on the recording, Everlong became a signature song for the band's late drummer, who joined the Foo Fighters in 1997, shortly after the album was finished. He famously appears bursting out of a bed and into a drum kit during the song's music video. Everlong also received a second life as an acoustic track in the wake of Grohl's live performance for the Howard Stern Show in 1998. I've waited here for you. When he stripped down the song to just guitar and vocals, Grohl ignited a reimagined and reinvigorated interest in both longtime and brand new listeners alike. That was a huge, huge song. It's a huge song as a rock song, and it's a huge song as an acoustic song. When I first came to LA, I arrived here at the very end of 95. So 96 was just K-Rock, K-Rock, K-Rock. It really was Weezer and, and uh, Pearl Jam and Nirvana were just omnipresent. It was like all you could hear. And it was amazing. It was a great time. Guitar rock, alternative bands, indie rock, whatever you want to call it. Grunge bands, you know, Soundgarden were all over the radio. Alice in Chains. It was an amazing time. And then, of course, the Foo Fighters. Now, Everlong got multiple leases of life because, of course, it had the great rock version with that amazing guitar riff and great drumming and just, that's a freaking awesome song. But then there was that second life. That acoustic version, it makes it more tender. I mean, the first version's a smash hit. The second version's an alternative version and still a smash hit. There's very few instances I can think of where a band, an artist like Dave Grohl, has reimagined one of his own songs and given it an equal life, an equal way of listening. It's pretty remarkable. I think Everlong is an absolute masterpiece, and the Foo Fighters are one of the best contemporary rock bands around. I'm always excited to see what they come up with next. They're always trying new things, trying simpler recording, more complicated recording, you know, pushing the boundaries of what a band can do, which is what we all want from rock music. So thank you, Dave Grohl. Thank you all of the guys of the Foo Fighters. I really appreciate it. Um, an amazing record. If you don't know the color and the shape, go buy it, download it, listen to it, stream it, whatever. It's a masterpiece. Really great record. Bradley Cook, Gil Norton, of course, and Chris Sheldon with the band produced an incredible record. Thank you. And Bob Ludwig, of course, for mastering. The great Bob Ludwig. All right, have a marvelous time recording and mixing. Thanks ever so much. I hope you enjoyed that. Please leave some other ideas down below for other songs, other artists, and other bands. So long, farewell, Havidazen, au revoir, tout scenes, dos vidania, um, ciao, adio, adios. So long, farewell, Havidazen, au revoir. Tschüss, goodbye.